Acts chapter number 6. Let's pray. Father, we love you and we praise you and we thank you for the word of God. And uh, Lord, I pray that you would shine your light on the scriptures tonight. I pray you'd illuminate the scriptures. And uh, Lord, help us to see the way you want us to see. And uh, I pray you bless your word now. We thank you for it. Thank you we have the, the word of God, the perfect word of God, the preserved word of God, the powerful word of God. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Acts chapter number six, in those days, what days were those? Those were uh, shortly after Pentecost and uh, everything is just booming. There's revival going on. People are getting saved and it's just a great time in the church. Um, I got saved back in the 70s and I didn't know how good things were back then. And uh, there was a lot of soul winning, a lot of church building and bus ministries and a lot of things were happening. And then it seemed like in the 80s, it kind of all hit a wall. And uh, then we've got the COVID and we got all kind of stuff going on. But uh, I, think, I think of what the Lord says there with Esther. You know, who knows, but you came in the, to the, time, the, the times of this, such a time as this. And this is our time. And uh, so I, we got to make the best of it, amen, do the best we can. In those days when the number of the disciples was multiplied, people were getting saved, people were being added to the church, uh, the ministry was growing, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. Now, they had uh, two different groups of people here. They're all Jews, but the Grecians are speaking one language, the Hebrews are speaking another language, and the Grecians feel like their widows are being neglected. And so there, there's some griping going on and some murmuring. Let me just say this. If you, if you have a problem in the church, go to the people that can fix it. Don't talk about it to everybody that can't do anything about it. And uh, it just seems to be that way in churches. You know, there's a mumbling and a groaning and a murmuring. And we could go, we could just spend the rest of the night on that. Back there in the book of Numbers, when they started murmuring and complaining, you remember the Lord sent the snakes out. And uh, I hate snakes, so let's not do that around here. If you got a problem, let somebody know about it. And then the 12 called the multitude of the disciples unto them. So at this point, we still have the 12 apostles. We're still in Jerusalem. It's still a totally Jewish church. And they said, it's not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. So they, they want to prioritize their time. They want to prioritize their activity. It's not like, you know, we're too good to serve tables. It's not that at all. But they want, to, they want to make the best of their time. And it says, Wherefore, brethren, look you out among you seven men of honest report, number one, full of the Holy Ghost, spirit-filled men, number two, and wisdom, they had to have some wisdom, whom we, we may appoint over this business. So we need seven men, and we can appoint them over this business of taking care of these tables and feeding these women and, and uh, getting rid of the problem. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. So what they're saying is we're, we're going to pray and uh, we're going to study and we're going to preach the word of God and uh, these seven men are going to assist us and I believe they're saying they're going to take care of the, the physical things. Uh, doesn't mean they're not spiritual men. They're spirit-filled men. And uh, the saying pleased the whole multitude. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith. And we'll be reading about him in the next chapter. And of the Holy Ghost. And Philip, we read about him in Acts chapter 8. And Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. And they set him before the apostles... When they had prayed, they laid their hands on them. Doesn't mean they beat them up, but I believe it means that they ordained them. If you remember in Acts chapter 13, they laid hands on Paul and Barnabas and, and sent them out. And uh, 
The word of God increased. This, this was a, a good plan, and it worked. And there were more people getting saved than ever. And the word of God increased. The number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly, greatly. We need to pray for souls. We need to pray for converts. We need to pray that the Lord builds the house because it is the Lord that builds the house. And a great, um, let me start reading verse 7 again. The word of God increased. The number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly. And a great company of the priests were beat into the faith. Now, these are not Catholic priests. They're Jewish priests. But they are priests and they are saved. And uh, don't be intimidated by priests. They need to be saved just like everybody else does. Amen. And uh, so we'll just stop there. A great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. So what we're going to look at tonight is we're going to look at deacons. I don't know for sure that these men were deacons. There's seven of them here. But uh, we'll just, just for the sake of it, we, we could argue either way. You could say, well, they're not deacons. They are deacons. Uh, they don't deek. Uh, whatever. But we'll just, we'll just I, I want to talk about deacons, so we're going to use these scriptures to do it. The church was growing, and people were being saved, and there's a lot of new converts need to be discipled, so they needed some organization in the church. Now, let me say this, it was a church before the deacons got there. It's a church before the deacons got there. When we started our church, we didn't have any deacons because... Uh, it just they had to be qualified and it was just a new church and so we didn't have any so the local church is an organization now I believe in the body of Christ meaning that the true church there's one Lord one faith one baptism I believe in a and a, it's, it's not Protestant it's Bible but I believe there's a church which is the body of Christ which we're when we're saved we're baptized into that one body by the Spirit of God and I also believe very strongly in the local church. So look at Philippians. Keep your hand here because we're going to come right back. But look at Philippians chapter number 1. Philippians chapter number 1. And I'm not going to give you much time to get there because I don't have a lot of time. Paul and Timotheus, the servants of Jesus Christ. Paul talks in Romans chapter 1, first book uh, chronologically in the Bible. <laughs> Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ. So we're all supposed to be servants of the Lord. All right? We're all supposed to be servants of the Lord. To all the saints in Christ Jesus, which are at Philippi, with the bishops and the deacons. So Paul writes this letter, and he writes to the saints, to the bishops, and to the deacons. So these are uh, the order in the church, okay? Okay. Um, Look in 1 Timothy chapter number 3, and we get into more detail with the deacons. 1 Timothy chapter number 3. In Acts chapter 6, he says, men that have, uh, are full of the Holy Ghost and a good report. Now we get into some real detail. In 1 Timothy chapter 3, this is a true saying, if a man desire the office of a bishop. Now, what do we read so far? How about a man? All right, we don't have pastorettes for Christianettes. We have pastors. All right, we have bishops. And uh, that bishop, we'll, we'll get into this in a minute, but the bishop is the office. There's two offices in the church, the office of bishop and the office of deacon. So this is a true saying. If a man desire the office of bishop, he desireth a good work. Now sometimes people will say to me, you know, I don't, I don't feel like I'm called to preach. And other times people will say they're called to preach and yet you would never know it by their life. Personally, God called me to preach. There's no doubt in my mind. I'm more sure when I got called to preach than when I got saved. I know I'm saved, but there was two different situations in my life. But when God called me to preach, I knew what he was doing. So it says here, if a man desires the office of a bishop, he desires a good thing. So hopefully that's something the Lord puts in their heart. And then it talks about the bishop. A bishop must be blameless. 
That doesn't mean sinless because nobody's sinless. But they need to have a good testimony. The husband of one wife, that's enough for anybody. Now that, that phrase there, the husband of one wife, there's a lot of different opinions on that. Does that mean a, a man has never been married can't pastor? Does that mean a man that's married and his wife has died can't pastor? Does it mean a man that's uh, been divorced and remarried can't pastor? So I'm just going to leave that for another time. Uh, vigilant, sober, good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach, not given to wine. Now my, my personal stand is not a little wine or some wine, and I know a little wine for the side. I know all the verses that people use. I, I believe it's no wine at all. Not given to wine. No striker, that means you can't beat people up. Can't hit your wife. Not greedy of filthy lucre, but patient. Not a brawler, not covetous. One that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. Now, a bishop is a ruler, and we'll get to that in a little bit. The bishop is the office. The elder, the pastor, is the man. For a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, uh, lest being lifted up with pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil. So we have all the requirements here for somebody that's going to be a pastor. Moreover, he must have a good report of them which were without, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. Likewise, must the deacons be grave, not double-tongued, means not talking about people behind their back, not given to much wine. Here's another excuse if you want to make one. Uh, not greedy of filthy lucre, holding the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience. And let these also first be proved. Then let them use the office of a deacon being found blameless. Even so must their wives be grave, not slanderers, sober, faithful in all things. Let the deacons be the husbands of one wife, ruling their children and their own house as well. For they that have used the office of a deacon well, purchase to themselves a good degree and great boldness in the faith, which is in Christ Jesus. So we have two offices here in the church. We have two ordinances. Believer's baptism, which is baptism by immersion, and we have the Lord's Supper, which is uh, you do the baptism once, but you do the Lord's Supper according to different churches, how they do it. Jesus didn't say exactly when to have it or how often to have it, but he said when you do it, do it in remembrance of me. So the Lord's Supper is a memorial, okay? So look in Romans chapter number 16. Romans chapter number 16. And I can't get there for some reason. I don't know what's going on here tonight. Romans chapter 16. I'm going one page at a time. Romans chapter number 16. I commend unto you Phoebe, our sister, which is a servant of the church, which is at St. Crea. Now, we are all supposed to be servants. He, he, Paul talked about himself being a servant. But we're not all deacons. Just because you're a servant doesn't mean you're a deacon. Now, the modern so-called Bible versions, many of them, instead of uh, putting in here a servant of the church, they leave it in the Greek word and they they call her a deaconess. And that's how you end up with deaconesses and deacons. And this is how you end up with uh, lady pastors and uh, people ordaining uh, ladies as, as pastors and as deacons. So let me just say this. When God wanted somebody to take care of the garden, he chose a man. He chose Adam, and Adam was to oversee the garden and take care of the garden and dress the garden. When he wanted somebody to rule the children of Israel, he chose Moses. Now, I know Deborah 
at a certain time during the judges was in a place of leadership, but she was there by default because the men wouldn't man up. It wasn't like she was the first choice. When God wanted somebody to rule Israel, when they wanted a king like everybody else, he got him Saul. He didn't give him a queen, he gave him a king. When God wants somebody to rule the church, he calls a man, a bishop, a pastor. When God wants somebody to, write, to rule the home, he calls the man and tells the man to be the head of the family. And in government, it's the same way. Now, I know we have a lot of ladies in government today, and uh, that doesn't mean it's biblical. Now, some people probably don't like what I'm saying, but I didn't write the Bible. I'm just telling you what the Bible says. And we're not supposed to just pick what we like and not take the rest. Turn back with me to Isaiah chapter number three, and we're not going to get through all of this tonight, obviously. Um, Isaiah chapter number three. So in Isaiah chapter three, when the prophet prophesies, usually it's not good news. You remember when Samuel was coming to anoint David, they were scared to death. Like, what's he going to tell us? Uh, remember Micaiah, he, uh, he said, don't, don't call him. He never has anything good to say. So the prophet normally would have a, a negative uh, message from God for the people when they were out of line. So in Isaiah 3, behold, the Lord... Uh, the Lord of hosts does take away from Jerusalem and Judah the stay and the staff, the whole stay of bread and the whole stay of water. So there's, there's famine, there's uh, God's judge in Israel, all right? And they're going to be going through really tough times. The mighty man and the man of war, the judge and the prophet and the prudent and the ancient, the captain of 50, the honorable man, the counselor and the cunning artificer, artificer, and the eloquent order. And I will give children to be their princes, and babes shall rule over them. So what's that verse saying? They're going to have immature leaders. You know, our founding fathers knew what they were doing when they said you got to be 35 to be president. And we did have a biblical foundation for our country, even though they'll try to tell you we didn't. And the people shall be oppressed, every one by another, and everyone by his neighbor, the child shall behave himself proudly against the ancient. There's no respect for the elders. In a lot of cultures, there's a, people are smart enough to know that people who've been around a long time have learned some lessons. But these people, there's no respect for the ancient and the base against the honorable. So look over with me in verse number 12. As for my people, children are their oppressors, and women rule over them. You got to understand, this, this was a punishment. This was not women's lib. This was not equality. And like it or lump it, this is what the Bible says, okay? As for my people, children are their oppressors, and women rule over them. O oh, my people, they which lead thee, notice, Cause thee to err and destroy the way of thy past. So when, they ha when you have the wrong leaders, you have people making wrong laws and wrong decisions, and you have a lot of mess on your hands. Anybody kind of relate to that or think about what we're going on in this world? doesn't have to be a, a lady to be a bad ruler. It doesn't mean a lady couldn't be uh, smarter than a man. But it's just talking about the idea that God puts a man in charge. All right, that's God's rule. That's God's order. That's God's authority. God is not the author of confusion. So that's the way God does it. He chooses uh, for the man to be in charge. Um, look at 1 Timothy. And what I'm talking about tonight is in a lot of a lot of churches, a lot of denominations and things, there's a lot of unbiblical, it's really the traditions of men and not Bible. You know, we talk about the Catholic Church with their traditions and uh, when it comes to church tradition, church teaching and the Bible, they'll choose the tradition over the Bible. 
But there's a whole lot of so-called fundamental churches that do the same exact thing. Amen. 1 Timothy chapter number 2. Look at verse number 7. Paul, Paul is speaking here. He says, whereunto I am ordained a preacher and an apostle. We have a lot of people taking the preaching out of the preacher today. And that's a sad thing. So he's a preacher and he's an apostle. He said, I speak the truth in Christ and lie not. A teacher of the Gentiles in faith and verity. So now there are no women, female apostles. They're all men. And last time we had class, we were talking about angels. And angels always appear as men. So this is God's order. This is what God orders. He said, I will therefore that men pray everywhere. I hope you are. Lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. So sometimes in church we'll lift our hands up. In like manner also the women adorn themselves in modest apparel. Modest apparel. It's amazing the way some people go out in public. I mean, it's just absolutely amazing. And it's just, it's not getting better, it's getting worse. So what kind of apparel, how should ladies dress modestly? Let me just say this for the men. We're supposed to be modestly also. And it's pretty amazing what some guys wear. Likewise, in matter, like manner also, the women adorn themselves in modest apparel, with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broidered hair or gold or pearls or costly array, but which becometh women professing godliness with good works. Let the woman learn in silence with all subjection, but I suffer not a woman to teach nor usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. For Adam was first born, formed, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. Notwithstanding, she shall be saved in childbearing if they continue in faith and charity and holiness with sobriety. So look at verse number 12. I suffer not a woman to teach nor usurp authority over the man. That doesn't mean the woman can't teach. It means the woman's not supposed to be teaching the man. The man's supposed to be teaching the woman. I'm supposed to be more spiritual than my wife. We have ladies teaching, they just don't teach men. And we don't have lady preachers. And the reason we don't is because it's Bible. That's why we don't. It's not, you know, you're against women or you're a chauvinist, you're this or you're that. It's nothing like that at all. It's just we're Bible-believing people. So we're just, we're just gonna stick with this thing. So that word usurp there is only in the Bible one time right here. I looked it up in the dictionary. It says to seize and hold in possession by force or without right. By force or without right. So what does that mean? It means a lady does not have the right to pastor a church. Amen. I mean, listen, you know, I know what the world says. I know what society says. And I know what the Bible says. And I'm just going to stick with the Bible. So that's the way it is around here. It's not like, you know, we're trying to make the ladies feel bad or embarrass them or anything like that. Uh, if a man desire the office of a bishop, right? Doesn't say if a lady. If a lady does, go join the Methodist. That's the only thing I can tell you. I'm not being smart, I'm just telling you. Look at 1 Timothy 5 and verse 17. Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in word and doctrine. For the scripture saith, thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treads out the corn, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. So it's talking, the verse here is talking about taking care of the, the pastor and uh, making sure, you know, that they're, they're provided for. But notice what it says, the elders that rule well. Okay, the elders that rule well. So, again, we're just going to scratch on this tonight, but look with me over in Titus. We'll come back here. Titus chapter number one. So Paul is talking to Titus in chapter one, verse five. He says, for this cause I left thee in Crete, that thou should set in order the things that are wanting and ordain elders in every city as I had appointed thee. If any be blameless, the husband of one wife, we just looked at these qualifications, 
having faithful children, not accused of riot or unruly, for a bishop must be blameless as a steward of God. Not self-willed, not soon angry. I'm not going to read them all again. But notice the elder is the man and the bishop is the office. When you're talking about an elder, you're talking about a bishop. You're talking about the elders being in the office of a bishop. So the bishop is a ruler, all right? The bishop is a ruler. The deacon is a servant. And that's not trying to put deacons down. It's just the Bible. Go back with me to 1 Timothy chapter 5. Verse 17. Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor. Now, here's what I believe in. I believe in a plurality of elders where you can have more than one elder, but I do not believe in equal elder rule. All right? John MacArthur pushes equal elder rule, but he doesn't practice it in his church. I guarantee you he is in charge of the church. So look in Acts chapter number 15. Acts chapter number 15. And let me give you a little background for this. They're up in Jerusalem. They're having a church council. And all the apostles are there. And beginning in verse 13, after they held their peace, James answered, saying, Men and brethren, hearken unto me. And it goes on. And in verse 19, Wherefore my sentence is that we trouble not them which from among the Gentiles are turned to God. Notice James says, My sentence, my decision. So there's a plurality of elders there, the apostles. They're all there together, and they all have their responsibility, and they're all serving God. But when they, when they hash it all out and it comes down to it, James makes the decision. And, and I, believe that's, I believe that's biblical, that the pastor, here, here's what I'm saying. I don't believe in a deacon-led church, a trustee-led church. I believe in a pastor-led church. I, I mean, I'm just telling you, I'm not hiding that fact. And I believe it's biblical. It's not like, well, I want to be the big shot or anything. And uh, we haven't covered this probably in years. I had somebody say this to me, and I'm not mad at them because of it. They t- and I've mentioned this before. They said, no church runs like our church. And I said, that's true. I said, that's why our church is where our church is at. And these other churches aren't. And I'm not saying that puffed up proudly. But when you look at the East Coast and you see all the size of all the different churches and all, there's a, there's a lot of wrong church politics. We don't have church politics here. And, and I'm glad for that. Let me give you a little background because I'm going to have to leave like in the middle of this thing. When I got saved, I was in a church and I went there when I was a little kid and it was called the Kirkwood Community Interdenominational Church. And there was a group of people there that were good people and I believe most of them were saved people. I don't know who wasn't saved. But in their church they had a group of deacons and they had a group of trustees and the deacons served the communion and the trustees ran the church and I got involved in this thing I wish I hadn't if I was saved longer uh, I wouldn't even got in it but I ended up running for deacon and it was just like you know people running for school board or running for congress you had you had people in the same church brothers and sisters in Christ and whoever loses is going to be very bitter. So I don't believe the politics, I think the whole thing was set up wrong. And I don't think these people were bad people, but I think that's all they knew. And then you had the trustees, and the trustees basically ran the show. They would have a, a uh, church meeting, uh, a business meeting, and uh, one of the men in the church, I guess it was the head trustee, would run the meeting, business meeting, and the pastor would sit in the front row, kind of like, you know, nobody. Every year they voted on whether or not to keep the pastor and whether he's going to keep another year or not. 
So, I mean, you think Congress is bad. They got to run for election every two years. Here, here's a pastor, and, you know, for whatever reason, if you didn't like him, he, you just got rid of him. Now, my mom's house was next to the parsonage. And when I was growing up as a kid, there was a new pastor about every two years, every three years. Some of them made it a little longer. Some of them didn't make it that long. But that is common in America today, that the, the average pastor only lasts two or three years. So I'm just saying, from that experience, we ended up in a big church split to see who was going to be in charge, the pastor or the trustees. And then it ended up... Uh, I thought everything was going to work after that. It didn't anyway. So we went from one broken system to another broken system, okay? So anyway, so here's what I'm saying. Uh, the pastor, the bishop, is supposed to lead the church. The deacons are supposed to assist, all right? Um, look in, uh, let, let me read what we got here. I'm, I got two minutes. Let me read from, I know I'm, I'm bouncing around up here and I'm not being as dogmatic as I want to be. Let me read from our church constitution and uh, we'll pick it up again next week, review it and make it clearer. So page three of our constitution, and if you want a copy, Brianna can make you a copy, just don't try and get it tonight. Uh, it says bishops are called elders or pastor, bishop. The church has two offices, bishop, also called elder or pastor. And then it gives the verses. The elders are to rule the church, 1 Peter 5, 1 and 2. 1 Timothy 5, 17. There are not ruling elders and teaching elders. Elders are to rule and teach. Notice we believe in a plurality of elders uh, according to the needs of the church. Now Ephesians talks about pastor and teacher. Talks about prof, uh, apostles, prophets, evangelists, and pastor and teacher. So the pastor is supposed to be the pastor and the teacher. The pastor is a shepherd, all right? Pastor watches over the sheep, takes care of the sheep. And then also Acts 20, 28, he's supposed to feed the sheep. Let me give you a verse. Look at Acts 20, 28. I love this verse. Acts 20, 28. Take heed, therefore, unto yourselves. Paul has called the elders of Ephesus together, and he's talking to them. And he says, all the flock over which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers. Notice that. The elder is supposed to oversee, to watch over, to feed the church of God, preach and teach the word of God, which he has purchased with his own blood. So whose church is it? It's not the pastor's church, it's God's church. And how did he get it? He purchased it with his own blood. Tremendously strong verse there for the deity of Christ. Okay? So, according to the needs of the church, but we do not believe in equality of rule, at least I don't. The co-pastor, associate pastors, assistant pastors, all other church staff have their responsibility delegated by the senior pastor, quote, ruling elder, and are accountable to him or the person he puts in charge. Example, church, James, the church of Jerusalem. We just looked at that. Responsibility to teach and preach the word of God, to pray and to win souls. Deacon. The deacon does not oversee the flock. He's part of the flock. He's a leader in the church, but he does not rule the church. Let me just say this. You will not see deacon board in the Bible. The only board in the Bible is the one they were floating on when they had the shipwreck. And you don't see chairman of the deacon board, and you don't see the deacons ruling the church or running the pastor. But you do see it. You just don't see it around here. Um, corporate officer, Solid Rock Baptist Church, a nonprofit corporation. Now that's, that's a very unbiblical situation right there because the, the state uh, burst the corporation. And we at one time had to make a choice whether we were going to be incorporated or not incorporated. The corporation takes a lot of the liability off of the people of the church, where if somebody church sues the church, they can't sue you as individuals. So that's another whole thing. Uh, as an accommodation, notice this wording, as an accommodation to legal relationships outside the church, five men shall act as trustees of the corporation. The senior pastor shall act as president. The co-pastor shall act as the vice president of the corporation. The remaining three members 
will be elected by a majority of eligible church members present and voting at a duly called church meeting and approved by the co-pastors. The trustees shall elect a corporate treasurer, corporate secretary from among the members. Trustees will serve without compensation for their duties. Now, we have four trustees right now. We need to get another one, and we've needed another one for a couple of years. We just haven't done it. I'm the president of corporation. Brother Chow is the vice president of corporation. Jim Petruzzi is the secretary of the corporation. Alan Baumgartner is the treasurer of the corporation. So when it comes to signing legal papers, like, for instance, we bought this lot out here, all right? You, ha you have to have a corporate resolution, and you have to have the secretary sign that resolution. So they act officially for the church, but they do not control the church. They don't say, we're going to buy, we're not going to buy. Uh, that comes down to right here behind this pulpit. And uh, it's been that way since day one. I'll just say this. Nobody told me to start the church. Nobody gave me the money to rent the truck to get me here. Nobody uh, gave me a pay instead of working eight years. And I could just go on and on about that kind of stuff. But I believe biblically, and let me say it again. I believe biblically, deacons are leaders of the church. You want to see where Stephen, he goes out and does all this stuff he does. Philip, he's one of them. He goes out and... Uh, the Ethiopian eunuch and preaches revival in Samaria. Uh, they're not, you know, deacons aren't just here to cut the lawn. Uh, I'm looking at Ken. He's not a deacon, but he's here trimming trees today with his son and all that kind of stuff. But the idea of a deacon is an idea of a servant to assist the pastor, but not rule the church, tell the pastor, tell the church what to do. A lot of churches, listen, a lot of churches have that thing out of whack, and it's unfortunate because uh, usually it doesn't work. Most of the churches in the Northeast have that kind of political... I'll give, I'll give you one little example. We were trying to revive a church and uh, had a 250-seat auditorium, four acres of ground, had a gym and an apartment, didn't have a pastor. They had about 12 people. The church had declined, and uh, I was preaching for them on a Sunday night, and I said, I'll bring somebody with me to sing. Oh, you can't do that. It's got to go through the music committee. It's like, look, you got 12 people. <laughs> they, honestly, listen, honestly, they had more committees than they had people. 